public health degree is one of the most marketable degrees out there because you are literally expected to know everything in a way. Like you're literally expected to know so much stuff that you never really realize. And that's just because of how connected everything is. So if you're about somebody who's really interested in solving problems, if you're somebody who loves learning all the time, because in public health, you never stop learning. You always have to be on top of everything to, you know, have the knowledge to share and like support people in different communities. Um, this is probably the field for you. And if you have doubts about it, just dive in, jump in, read a book, listen to all of Omari's podcast episodes, like just take the time to learn about it. And if you feel like it's for you, you belong, like everybody belongs in public health. We all have a role to play at the end of the day. Um, if you want to take it a step further, that's totally up to you. Um, but yeah, do it like drink the Kool-Aid, come here, be here. We need you to support us and to support everybody else around you. <laughs> This is the Public Health Millennial Career Stories Podcast, where you'll hear about diverse career stories, career strategies, get tips, and learn from others to help you in your public health career journey. If you want to learn about public health, public health careers, or just hear public health stories, stay tuned because you won't want to miss this. Welcome to the Public Health Millennial Career Stories Podcast, episode number 66 student edition. Hi everyone, Omari Richens here. Thank you all so much for joining me once again for a beautiful another edition of this podcast, student edition, second one. Really excited to bring you today's guest. Before anything, make sure that you subscribe to the show, gets out to the most amount of people. Make sure that you like this, you share it with a friend. And uh, if you want to support, go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash the PH millennial. Greatly appreciate that. I think that the student is doing a lot of amazing things, as you probably all already know on Instagram. And I'm, I'm glad to be sharing my platform and giving her a space to share about her experiences and some of the insights that she has gained over this time. I apologize. I don't think my mic was plugged in for this episode, so it does sound a bit weird, but um, on my side, at least. But regardless, we get we get stuff done. And uh, with that being said, I hope you enjoyed the episode. Cayman is currently pursuing her master of public health degree in health policy and management at the University of Alberta in Canada. She's passionate about health equity and wishes to change the way we create policies in all facets of our society. Cayman also loves educating people about public health topics such as menstruation, sexual health, racism, and so much more. In her spare time, she loves eating burritos. So if you if you feel like <laughs> you learned something from her, support her by buying her a burrito on coffee, and we'll talk a little bit more, more about that later on. Uh, welcome <laughs> to the show, Cayman. How are you doing? Good. Thanks so much for having me. I've always wanted to be on this podcast. So when you reached out, I was really excited to be here. <laughs> yeah, it truly is my pleasure to have you on. And uh, this is going to be on the student edition, but I'm definitely going to have you back on after you graduate uh, to tell more about your, your in-depth story and, and everything like that. So I look forward to, to just hearing more about your insights today. And then uh, keep on connecting because I know we've been connected for a while now yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so to, to tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what are your preferred pronouns um so my name is Cayman just as Amari said earlier I use she her pronouns um I am a MPH student like I mentioned earlier um at the U of A in Canada and I I don't know I'm pursuing health policy and management and I kind of went into that area just because, so prior to getting my MPH, I actually did a uh, undergrad in public health as well. It was like a two year fast track undergrad program. And the reason why I did it is because I had no idea what public health was um, and I wanted to learn more about it. And that entire degree was really focused on like health promotion and epidemiology and statistics. And I felt like I didn't really get much of the policy management kind of aside. So I was kind of looking at different programs to see what they offered. And I'm all about being a well-rounded <laughs> person. And I'm like, you know what? I need more information on this. So I'm going to pursue my MPH on this, uh, which is the health policy management. Um, but yeah, I also run an Instagram account. Um, and I spend a lot of time researching topics for that. And I really, really enjoy what I do. Um, and I've gotten to know like amazing people like Omari on uh, Instagram and like a lot of other people that you've actually interviewed that I like constantly will DM every other day to check in and see how everyone's doing. Um, but yeah, that's like a little bit about me, I guess. <laughs> okay, okay, that's awesome. And drop, drop your Instagram handle. 
uh, it's Kamen, so K-A-M-A-N dot M-P-H. Um, and that's where you can find me. Okay, so definitely go and follow her there and uh, buy her burrito if you feel inclined. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. I love those. I eat at least one or two every other week. <laughs> That's pretty impressive. That's pretty impressive, to be honest. But, uh, t- tell me a little bit more about the the fast track public health program that you talked about for undergrad. And did you go to undergrad at University of Alberta as well? No. So I actually have two undergrad degrees. Um, I did my first one at Mount Royal University, and I pursued it in um, like general science. So I took a lot of like chemistry and physics and biology, computer science, um, geography. It was just like a well rounded. Um, science degree. And then through that, I really didn't know what I wanted to do afterwards, because I'm not super into doing like very science based research. I tried it, didn't like it. Um, But what I do like is problem solving. And I'm like, okay, well, there's so many problems in the world. And I think a lot of the things that I've learned is important from this degree program, but not what exactly what I wanted to do. Um, Then I thought about med school. (laughs) And I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to go exactly what my parents want me to do. I'm going to go to medical school. Um, And then I took a microbiology class and part of the class, there was like a small little unit uh, that was about public health. And I like fell in love. I was like, I need more classes on this, but unfortunately that university didn't offer a lot of like public health classes. Um, So I thought I'm going to go get my master's. So I graduated from that degree program in 2018. And I had also applied to go to the U of A Uh, for the fall. And then I also applied to two-year fast track programs because I had a feeling I wasn't going to get in. My grades weren't the best um, in my first degree program. And yeah, that's basically what ended up happening. I didn't get into U of A, but I did get into this um, program at the University of Lethbridge. And it's like a two-year program and you learn, like I said, a lot of health promotion topics, uh, epi, statistics. Um, And since I was doing it from a distance, I had like more limited options uh, to choose from if, as opposed to like doing it on campus. And that I graduated from that one last year in 2020. Um, so I didn't actually have a graduation. I mean, I wasn't planning on going, but <laughs> it, was, it was still sad to know um, I wasn't able to go. But that's kind of a little bit about that program. And I think that's fascinating that uh, you found out about public health in a microbiology class. That's not something, yeah. that's not something you hear about often. <laughs> Uh, and what, what really sparked, sparked your interest in, in going into public health and going into health promotion, health education and understanding that? So once I took that microbiology class, so the first story that um, we were taught was about Jon Snow. And I was like, this guy is so sick. I was like, <laughs> like the fact that you can just like create a map and, you know, think about and try to like break down where the outbreak was happening and kind of do like a little bit of detective work and your problem solving was just very, very fascinating to me. And then I also love the fact that it was on um, a larger scale. And then at my university, uh, my first one that I went to, there was a uh, program called Peer Health Educators. And so you were assigned a topic every month to present um, to the entire school, like in the main hallway, you would like either put a poster presentation together or you would put an activity or some sort of intervention together uh, based on the topic. And I really enjoyed that. And at the beginning of every uh, year when we started our training, we would have like small little principles of health promotion uh, packed into it, but it wasn't like enough. And then I ended up taking some time to like learn a little bit more about it and connecting with the people at that office. Um, who mentored me a little bit to teach me more about public health and gave me a bunch of like documents and stuff to read. So I was more keen on like what it actually was. And the thing that I love about it the most is like public health is problem solving. There's so many complex and wicked problems that are out there that I'm like, I want to be able to solve them. I want to know where they come from. Why do they happen the way that they do? Um, And it basically like captures all of my interests because like I said I like being well-rounded I always have a million things on the go um, and I love learning about lots of different topics and I love the fact that public health just like swallows all of it and like borrows from different disciplines um, so I always feel like I'm learning all the time. Okay that, that was absolutely a great <laughs> great story in the public health and I, I definitely agree with you like Jon Snow is definitely one of the first things that I learned about in like public health and I was like oh this is really cool especially like considering the time the time that he was in and yeah. just like those methods could be 
still apply to today, but and I know we have like ArcGIS and all these different um, statistical softwares, but it was just really fascinating that he was a disease detective essentially yeah. and, and solved the outbreak just by like looking at what the situation was, where, where people were getting sick and then really coming up with solutions. And I want to say it, it took the city a while for them to listen to, to him and take down the pump. Um, but. Yeah, exactly. I mean, when they're public health professionals, sometimes not listen to. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the same thing is happening today, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, and then tell me a little bit more about, so, so you said that you, you wanted to do health policy and management at University of Alpeton because you, you felt like you lacked that side of um, understanding from public health. So tell me a little bit about why you had that interest and then why University of Alberta was the school for you to choose. Yeah, so policy, I think, is just kind of like the higher level of interventions that anyone can really get into to make bigger changes. So when I was thinking about one, going into medical school, I was like, oh, maybe if I go, I could do a little bit of public health on the side and that could be something that I'd be interested in. But I'm very much the type of a person that, doesn't like working one on one with people. I love working with like a crap ton of people all at once. And I like knowing that there's different people that I can go to for certain things. And then I thought, okay, well, clearly going to medical school would mean that I would mostly have like one on one patient interactions. Um, and that's not literally what I want to do. And I would need to climb and like take lots more time to get into that those leadership roles. And those are really hard to get into. Um, as well. So I thought, okay, what's like a different route? And then I came across um, health policy and I learned about like different types of policies where, for example, sugar tax, I think was the first one I was introduced to. And I'm like, oh, I never really thought about it as a policy or like as an intervention. And then from there, I learned a little bit more about like abortion policies and different sexual health policies and I kind of ended up diving into that topic a lot more. And that's kind of like where my bread and butter is. I know a lot more about those topics. And I thought, okay, well, if I put in laws or I put in policies or different interventions, that's gonna help or maybe not help more people in different ways, right? So I might as well learn more about it and like why politicians and decision makers make the decisions that they do based on evidence. Um, and so I decided to go into that route. I was more interested in policy than in management, um, but it just was a combined program. And so in Canada, there's not a whole bunch of public health schools um, to really pick and choose from. And a lot of them are general programs. So you don't really get um, any specializations and you kind of have to like pick your classes the way that it goes. So the U of A has always been on my radar to be like my number one school that I wanted to get into. Um, and the reason why it was the first accredited uh, public health school in Canada and it also has an amazing faculty that like work in all different types of areas. I was really drawn um, into this program because of Professor Timothy Caulfield. I unfortunately don't even get to be taught by him <laughs> um, at all, but he was one of the reasons why I definitely wanted to go to the school. Um, he does a lot of work around uh, misinformation, specifically science misinformation. So he did lots of campaigns uh, for COVID-19 here in Canada as well. And I'm like, I want to be taught by this man because I thought he taught um, health law, but he, I think, I'm not sure what happened, but he like didn't teach health law when I took it and which, which is totally fine. Um, but the rest of the faculty that I gotten to know are incredible. Like besides being professors, they also work on lots of different projects and have so much experience um, here at the U of A. And like living in Alberta is a lot cheaper than like living in other provinces as well. And so I needed to think about the money as well and what would be most beneficial for me. And as a graduate um, from the U of A, you're more likely to get, to get a job here in Alberta, especially um, if that's where you want to stay, which I'm not 100% sure yet, but it was just closer to home, a lot easier, didn't have to deal with too much. Um, and it had multiple specializations. There's like seven that you can choose from um, at our school. So I thought if I didn't like something, at least I would have the option to go into something else later on if I really wanted to. But I, I love my stream. I wouldn't change it for the world. <laughs> okay, okay, awesome. And tell me, how, how, has, how has COVID-19 been for classes? Because you said you graduated during the pandemic and then now you started an MPH program during the pandemic. And I'm guessing that it's probably going to start getting back to some sort of normalcy maybe in the fall or next year. 
Yeah, honestly, the day that I got the email saying, oh, we're going to be <laughs> online for the rest of the year, I was crushed. Um, I remember it was like June, probably 25th of 2020, I got that email. And I was really nervous, but like not too nervous because my second degree was mostly online. Like I had night classes that I would go to um, on campus, like in downtown Calgary, but mostly I did everything from home. And so I wasn't too worried about that, but I was most so worried about like making friends and making connections because I literally did not do that in my second degree. Like I barely got to know my classmates except for the ones that I saw in person. Um, but those folks didn't graduate with me because a lot of them were parents um, and they were taking more time to complete their degree. Whereas I had a lot of free time uh, to finish off my degree in two years. And so I like barely made friends in that program. And that's all I really wanted to do is be a part of a cohort. So I was really nervous um, about that aspect, but honestly, like not so bad um, at all. Most of my classes were synchronous. So you would attend Zoom lectures. Those weren't the best experiences because I live in the middle of nowhere. And sometimes my internet likes to go out. Um, so that's happened to me quite a few times. I had lots of laptop issues this past year. Um, but finally sorting them out. And I actually ended up making like really great connections with most of my classmates. Um, we used to set up Among Us games after our uh, 8 p.m. lecture um, just to play for like an hour before bed. And yeah, we just got to know each other like playing games through Zoom or like lots, like lots of different games and like having deep conversations. I think that's what we're really about. Like our cohort is very emotional, very deep very friendly group of people. Um, so we're hoping that we can also pass that along to the incoming cohort too, because I know a lot of people are nervous about that. Yeah, yeah, that sounds awesome. I'm, I'm glad that you are getting that community that you didn't get in your last degree. And uh, even though the pandemic is, is going on, it seems like you're all finding different avenues to connect and really build that community and relationships mm -hmm. and understanding. And I feel like there's just a lot of learning that happens with your cohort members uh, outside of like just general classroom time. So, so I'm glad that that uh, it, it is working out well for you so so far. Mm -hmm. So I, I know that you are doing a lot of amazing things um, in school, on Instagram, and everywhere in between. Uh, so would, would you like to just share some tips that you have for other students who might be thinking about pursuing their, their degrees in public health? Um, I think like the first thing is to maybe do some like background on what public health is and like why you might be interested in it. Something that I've learned um, just even connecting with a few of my cohort members um, at my program, a lot of them like graduated from their undergrad and then just like went straight into this master's program without any experience. And so sometimes when they're in classrooms, they have a harder time connecting to the material because, you know, sometimes prof professors will ask, um, oh, like, have you ever had a work experience or, you know, a type of volunteer public health experience where you've dealt with like this principle or like, what does that look like in a real life setting? And so if you don't have the experience to talk about it, you may feel a little bit more of like that imposter syndrome feeling or you may feel like you don't belong in the program, but you definitely do. I just think it's really important to take the time to like learn more about it, follow people who like do this sort of work, go, you know, watch videos, read books um, to kind of like get yourself in that mindset to get excited. Um, I know that once a lot of my classmates ended up doing that, they started enjoying the program a lot more, um, even though they don't particularly have the work experience. Cause I was fortunate enough before going into you know, this master's program and even my public health um, fast track program that I did have some public health experience. And then I was able to also do a full time job with like my second public health undergrad degree, which was basically it was um, I was a relationship and sexual health educator. So I taught sex ed classes. But on top of it, I also did curriculum design and like program planning um, and like used a lot of the skills that I learned in my undergrad to actually practice. And then when I went into my master's, I was able to like be like, okay, now I have the work experience and like base knowledge that I can actually use in classrooms to talk about the different things that I do. Um, I think the other tip is like time management is so important <laughs> when you're in grad school, especially if you're anything like me and you love dipping your toes into multiple different things, uh, just to give like pers or context to that. 
I'm currently also the president of our student association at the School of Public Health. I'm also a health policy brief writer for the Public Health Youth Association of Canada. I also am a part of um, an advocacy group that we started um, at the university as well. Um, like I run my Instagram page. I still have to check in with my friends and family. Like I can't ignore them. Um, I also have a full-time job over the summer and I'm taking classes like there's a lot of stuff that's going on and time management is so key to get you through your day. Um, but also like cutting yourself off, like giving yourself a routine where you wake up early, do the things that you need to do, plan that day out and like cut yourself off at 9 p.m. At least my brain can't work past 9 p.m. Like if you ask me to do something after 9 p.m., I won't do it. <laughs> there's no point in asking me. Um, but I think those two things that I would recommend is background research and then time management just to keep those at the forefront if you're hoping to pursue something like this. Okay, and, and to, to that point, give us some of your time management skills that you use. Um, so something that's really been helping me is uh, time blocking. So I use Google Calendar and I color code different tasks. So as an example, um, just over the summer, anything that's in yellow in my calendar has to like pertain to my full-time job. And so I like block out, okay, during this time, I'm gonna be doing research for my job. During this time, I'm gonna do the writing. I have a meeting at this time. And those are all color coded. And then anything that's related to uh, me running the student association, for example, that's color coded in pink in my calendar. So I'm like, okay, I have a meeting at this time and this time and this time that I have to attend and like maybe write um, an email or send a couple of emails. And then I'm also taking a class and those are color coded in green. So, okay, I need to write, start writing this paper. This is how many words I need to write them down. Um, breaking like your large tasks into chunks really does help. Um, I did that a lot over the semester. I had like a 20 page paper to write for my health law class. And that just gave me a lot of anxiety. So I like broke down how many words that was. And then I started writing it like a month and a half before it was due. And I wrote like, 100 or 200 words a day because that's more manageable for me um, as opposed to the week is due and I'm just sitting there going at it trying to finish it um, off so I think like whatever your large task is like really make them into smaller tasks if you like using google calendar do that I also have a, an agenda that I use um, so I write down like what's happening every day but I break everything down then by time in my calendar so it reminds me when to do things and when not to do things oh also schedule and breaks i like do that too those are in purple <laughs> in my <laughs> calendar so that's kind of something that helps <laughs> i think that's awesome and how, how often do you update this calendar is it weekly is it bi-weekly weekly so every sunday night um i am sitting at my laptop being like okay what do i have for the day what do i need to get done um and then obviously if things come up that i can't ignore for the week then i have to find a way to like put it into my calendar somehow so I can either attend that thing or like write whatever somebody needs my attention for <laughs> to do. Okay, that, that is awesome practical advice there. So everyone definitely take that advice. I definitely should have taken that advice. <laughs> I've spent many a nights trying to finish up papers and, and maybe just breaking it into 200 words a day would have been a lot more helpful and a lot less stressful. Yeah. Yeah, like I think it really helps to know when's the best time that you work at. Like I know I work best in the mornings um, versus like in the evenings. Evenings, I just want to like lay down, eat ice cream, watch New Girl. Like I don't want to do anything. So I always cut myself off at like 9 p.m. Uh, to do any type of work. And then, then I put myself into a bedtime routine. So then I fall asleep and then I don't feel tired the next day. Um, which helps too. Like, I think this is also the part about getting old. I used to never be able to do this. And like, here I am <laughs> doing these things now. I, I completely understand you there. Like <laughs> right now I'm, I'm like, I have a bedtime routine as well. I try to go to bed before like 10, 10, 30. Get a, I get a pretty early like 5, 5, 30, depending on the day. Um, what, what does your, your routine look like, bedtime and, and morning routine? Um, I was a lot better at this like this past semester, because that's when I integrated this Google calendar time blocking thing. So mm -hmm. I used to wake up at like seven in the morning and like for the first hour, I would call it me time. So yeah, I wake up at seven, first hour is me time. And I take that time to like meditate, get ready for the day, make breakfast. Um, I'll sometimes listen to a podcast or read a book uh, in the morning, just kind of depends on what I'm feeling. 
Um, but I'll definitely like listen to a podcast while I'm making breakfast. And it's, I like humorous podcasts, like in the morning or sometimes in the mood for a public health podcast in the morning, just kind of depends on how I wake up that day. Um, and then after that, I'll basically jump into whatever my first task is. I like to keep them really light. So it's usually emails is the first thing that I'll do in the morning, just answer whatever's in my inbox. And then I'll get into either assignments or work, or I don't know, a project that I'm working on. Um, and then at nine, I'll cut myself off and then I'll like get ready for bed. Usually, okay, this is something that I think everyone should try. Like, I'm not even kidding. I got a lot of my friends on this and now they like text me and they're like, you changed my life because of this thing. Mm -hmm. So basically, um, I don't know if you let people have like just bathtubs or showers, whatever it is, turn all the lights off in your bathroom and put candles on. If you have a shower, obviously you can bring them into the shower, but like just have them arranged safely <laughs> in your bathroom and then like put on instrumental music and like have however long of a shower that you want to have and it's just so relaxing and then afterwards I like to read a book um before bed and then I'll like take pick whatever book that I'm kind of into at the moment usually nothing heavy because then I like go to bed with a lot of my mind. Um, usually it's like a fiction book that I'm kind of into. Um, and then I'll like go to sleep. And if I can't sleep at that time, then I'll like listen to, oh, what do they call like sleep podcasts where they either like tell you a story uh, before bed or like help you meditate before bed. And then I just pass out after that. And it's, it's really great. Like, please do that. If you have a hard time sleeping, it's changed my life. <laughs> okay, that was awesome. And that, that entire routine there just seems like you're a very high productive person. And I guess <laughs> it, it makes sense because you have like a bunch of different rules that you're juggling and different things that you're doing. Um, were you going to say something? No, I was just going to say, I like literally don't have a choice. <laughs> um, I'm a Taurus. We <laughs> are sometimes can be like very lazy people. And I do this for like just to keep myself accountable and productive because if I could get away with it I would do nothing all day and I would just eat and watch tv all day um so I do this to keep myself accountable to what I've signed up on <laughs> yeah that, that that definitely makes sense the calendar whole video accountable to all the tasks that you do so tell me how, how did you get involved in all these different things that you said uh you said you like write health briefs you're the president of the public health association you know, helping the youth public health association, you know, some, some bunch, bunch of different things. You got your Instagram page, your job, your school. How do you get involved in all of these things? Um, I, so like, I think one of the reasons why I decided to pursue a lot is because I like, don't like the feeling of being left behind. I also feel a lot of FOMO. Like, I like, I have a fear of missing out on a lot of different things. Um, so when I, initially applied to the U of A, I also like looked at different universities and whether they not they had like a student association um, because I really enjoyed doing that during my first undergrad. And then I didn't do any of that during my second one. And I felt like I was missing a part of me for like not participating in student politics. <laughs> um, and so I was like, you know what, I'm going to run. And I'm also the type of person that's like, go big or go home. Either you're gonna run for president or you're not gonna do it. Um, <laughs> So I decided to run for uh, president and it was a really cool experience. Um, this was like one of the first times where I didn't actually start something and I like had to, I guess, like apply just like everybody else. Um, so I was kind of nervous to do it, but excited that I ended up getting the position. And for me, like anytime I take on a leadership role or like want to be a part of something, it's really intentional. Um, I like don't like doing things willy nilly. Um, anything that I pursue it's because I want to put a lot of time and energy and attention into it because it matters to me and so the biggest reason why I went into uh, running for the student association was because um, our experience of like being integrated into the program wasn't the best and I also understand because you know COVID-19 was happening and that probably impacted um, our first impressions of going into the program and there was probably lots of things that everyone had to learn. But personally, like I've been doing online school for at least like two years prior to that. And I also taught online um, while I was being like the relationship and sexual health educator. And I did a lot of like online teaching research over the summer for my organization that I was working for. So I had like some things to at least share because I've already had those experiences and I have knowledge on it. 
Um, and then plus, I just wanted to make it fun. And I wanted to give our students more of an opportunity to grow and like meet other public health professionals. Um, and I also wanted to meet other students from different universities. So through this role, <laughs> I also started the Pan-Canadian Public Health Student Network, um, which incorporates all the different um, public health schools across Canada and we meet monthly and like we have different projects and stuff that we're working on as well, um, which is like super, super fun and we have quite a few things on the go and I don't even know how we manage all of it, but we end up doing it. So that's with that. Um, the second thing that I do is I'm a health policy brief writer for um, the Public Health Youth Association of Canada. They're like a new organization. I think they started it um, in November or December 2020. And essentially the reason why they started the program, one of the girls that started it is actually um, on the pan-Canadian thing. She's also the president of her own student association um, at the university that she goes to. And they started it because public health is not super well known. And especially in Canada, I feel like, like even my own mom, like she'll enter the chat and she'll be like, I don't know what public health is. But like, this is so embarrassing. Like I have a degree and a half <laughs> on this topic and so um she also experienced a lot of that of like people not knowing what it is and like now it you know public health public health public health being all over the news and people now being interested in into these programs and it's only like offered in the master's level there's only two provinces that i think offer a public health um undergrad program and that's the one that i went to and then a, a one or two i think maybe in ontario um and so you know, people are now curious about it and a lot of youth don't know about it. So she started it with um, one of her other colleagues and she wanted it to be like a really big way to advocate for changes. So I was more interested in that policy aspect because I'm doing my, you know, degree on it. So I thought might as well get the experience to write briefs um, and write about topics that I'm really passionate about that could possibly be pushed over to um, different politicians. And currently for now, the organization is like working towards getting government relation people um, on our team so we can actually like have those meetings with uh, policymakers and like have those discussions about our briefs and like really bring them forward into um, the legislative room and like talk about all these different things and so that was more intentional so I could like learn how to con write concisely learn how to really advocate for my ideas um, take more time to actually research different topics that I'm interested in um, so far, I think I have like three or four briefs that have been published. And so that's, I don't know, just exciting to see that <laughs> um, happen. So there's that. I'm like, what else do I do? Um, there is the, it's called School of Public Health Students for Advocacy and Rights. Um, it was a group that I started in December of 2020. And it started because our premier actually just said some not great stuff um, about the South Asian community um, in the city that I live in. And they basically like blamed the COVID-19 spreading on them. And if anyone is ever curious about Alberta's um, pandemic plan, it's been a wild year living here um, with our pandemic plan. And obviously we had a huge spike of hate crimes as well against um, BIPOC people here in this province, like over the pandemic as well. So, you know, having these like comments and rhetoric being pushed forward was like not okay. And I was pissed off personally. And I'm like, I can stay in my room and I can be upset or I can do something about it. And so I ended up gathering a bunch of my different friends uh, who are also interested in this topic. We put out an open letter uh, that came out in February 2020, it caught a bunch of media attention, something that we weren't really expecting. And like ever since then, we've been now advocating for race-based data collection um, here in the province and have been working on that as a project as well. Um, so that's been like super cool. I'm like, I don't know. Oh, then I run my Instagram page and there's that. And I usually have put that in the back burner, but I love like connecting with students um, on there, people that are interested in public health on there. Um, and I usually write about different topics that I'm either writing my papers in for school um, or lessons that I've learned, um, just like being an MPH student. And that's 
those are all the things I think for right now that I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's awesome. That's, that's dope that you're doing all those things and kudos to you for starting all those organizations or associations <laughs> and, and really putting in that work to, to get things done. Um, that, that really is awesome. And I think, like, as you said, you, you saw an issue and you said, I can complain about it or I can do something about it. And I'm glad that you're doing something about it. Um, <clears throat> so going back to your, your Instagram now, uh, mm -hmm. command dot, at command.mph. Uh, Tell me, so why, why did you start this? What kind of stuff do you post on there? So I actually started that in 2018. So December of 2018 is when I started my Instagram page. And I think at that time in my life, I was interested in like applying to MPH programs again, but I thought, okay, I didn't get in the first time. Maybe there's, there's like a lot of like med school accounts. There has to be public health school accounts. Um, and at that time, December 2018, there was nobody except for um, a person named Diana. Diana doesn't post as much anymore, um, but I love Diana. And I think Tanya was also posting a little bit at the time too. Um, at that time, she was known as All About the Scrub Life. And now it's, I think, Labor with Tanya K, right? I think mm -hmm. that's what uh, yeah. her handle is now. And there's the only two accounts <laughs> that I came across and the rest were just little university school public health accounts which i wasn't interested in obviously um and then i thought well if nobody else is doing this then i might as well just share my journey on how i got into the school of public health in canada um and that's kind of like where that happened and i ended up posting different topics um my instagram like took some time to definitely grow because not a lot of people were interested in public health. It wasn't until 2020 where I ended up seeing so many more accounts, so many more people. Um, and just like seeing even my own numbers boost at the time. But I typically post about, you know, my grad school journey. I always do a live at the end of every semester uh, talking about my experiences, sharing any tips, textbooks, like whatever anybody wants to know, I will answer those questions honestly. Um, and then I also post about uh, sexual health topics and I do menstruation May every year where I talk about um, different menstrual products or like different issues uh, when it comes to menstruation. And I share, I do also like a policy series where I'm trying to dissect different policies just so we can have conversations about them. Um, a lot of that has been put on the back burner, but I think the biggest thing that I really do is answer so many DMs um, <laughs> every week. Um, with students from all over the world, in Canada, in the States, in India, in Australia, like you name it, I probably have answered <laughs> a DM from a different country, where I just answer questions about people curious about the program, wanting to learn more. Um, so I try my very best to like help and share my experiences and stuff with them and give them the advice. My favorite DMs that I do get is during um, acceptance season, where people finally tell me that they've gotten accepted to the school and that makes me really excited and really happy um, to know and I even I've, I've even gotten to connect with like people coming into my program uh, for this fall so it's like nice to know that I can even provide advice like prior to them even starting um, but yeah that's been the biggest thing I do is that is answer DMs. <laughs> and I, I, I'm guessing that's why you get a lot of burritos. <laughs> yeah probably. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's really awesome man I, I didn't know that you started in 2018 but that that, that's amazing that you as as once again like you saw that there wasn't uh anyone out there doing it and you decided to do it and it's funny that you brought up diana uh today because i thought about her today because i was like oh <laughs> she she did like public health design thinking stuff and i thought that was really cool and then like when i got on instagram she just stopped posting so so that <laughs> diana if you see this please come back um <laughs> <laughs> i know i think she's like she really moved towards human-centered design Diana is amazing. She's my first friend that I made on Instagram. <laughs> like, I want her to post more, but I know she's really busy. <laughs> same, same. I'm, I'm going to up in the DMs and let her know that we need her to post. <laughs> um, okay, awesome. Uh, well, thank you for sharing that. And be sure to go uh, follow, uh, come on on on, on um, Instagram. Came on on Instagram, sorry. Um, okay. So tell, I, I was created some space for you to talk about a specific topic that you wanted to talk about. So Here's your space. All right, you have the floor. Um, okay, so I think something that I really want to talk about is advocacy and um, how students can get involved in advocacy. And I think it's, and the reason why I want to talk about it is because you can always get your public health experience like 
prior, like prior to even graduating. Cause I think a lot of people get really anxious about, oh my God, like, where am I going to find a job? I don't even have public health experience. Like, am I even going to find something? And then they take on so many like free unpaid work, so many free like internships, um, except for internships in Canada have to be paid, fun fact. So they can't be free here. Um, but they sometimes won't use the word internship at all. Um, and a lot of like students end up doing a lot of like free unpaid labor, which in my opinion, isn't okay because everyone's got to eat. <laughs> everyone's got to pay bills um, and people take advantage of students all the time. But I think if you're trying to think about it, the best time to do that, because you're covered by your loans most likely, is to do it during your actual program, is to gain as much experience as you can. So after you graduate, you don't actually have to go take unpaid work um, anymore. So advocacy is a really great way to actually get into, I think, or even build the experience, just because you learn so many different skills um, in such a short period of time. So I specifically, I think, want to talk about my own experience with uh, the race-based data project that ended up just coming out of nowhere and I didn't really realize it was going to be a thing um, but honestly like through that project I've learned so many different lessons I've been able to engage with government officials I have meetings every other week with different politicians um, and that's not something that I ever dreamed of like prior to doing it and I think if there's a topic that you're really passionate about something that's really helped us a lot is connecting with the right people um, we've had professors who are quite famous <laughs> um, on Twitter, um, share our work for us. And then therefore it got blasted to like different politicians. The next thing you know, media is contacting us to like try to have interviews and like talk to us about the projects and stuff that we're working on. Um, and leveraging social media has been an amazing, amazing journey for myself, either personally, like through my Instagram account and doing advocacy work that way, or with a group of other students, like-minded people um, that are also passionate about the same topic. And advocacy also seems very scary, I think, sometimes to get into. And I was terrified. Like when I found out that the media wants to have a meeting with us since I was the student like association president, it's required of me to be the spokesperson. And I just remember sitting in my room and I called one of my friends and I was like, I'm going to throw up. And she's like, no, you're not. And I was like, I'm going to throw up. It's going to be so bad. And she's like, no, no, it's going to be good. Um, and it's just nice having like a team behind you to like support you in those moments as well. And after you kind of get into a topic that you're really passionate about in terms of advocacy, it opens so many different doors. We're currently as a group now working on publishing commentaries in different journals. We're working towards um, gaining funding for the projects that we want to work on um, to support smaller nonprofit organizations. Um, and we've also gotten in touch with lots of other nonprofit organizations that are also advocating for the same thing. So you're also building networks at the same time. So if you're actually wanting to go into a job like later on in the future with some nonprofit or some organization, you already have that door open for you, um, which is also really cool. And I think the other thing that I've learned a lot throughout this is, you know, government engagement and relations and how do you actually run meetings? How do you facilitate them? How do you because uh, sometimes, you know, politicians only have five minutes to talk to you or like 15. I talked to one a couple of weeks ago and he was simultaneously in three different meetings while he was talking to us. Um, but he was actually really good about like paying attention and like answering questions and things like that. But it's like you have to be very quick and concise about what you want to say to get your point across. Um, and then he has to take it, regurgitate it and like come back to you later on. Um, but that meeting went like pretty successfully because I prefer like being concise in the things that I say to people. Um, and now he's connecting us with other politicians because we have multiple projects on the go. Um, another one is around harm reduction and we're trying to open up a lot of safe consumption sites that have actually been closed down in our province because of the pandemic. Um, and a lot of overdoses obviously have spiked since then too. So we're trying to open up a lot of those, um, especially the major and more popular ones that people used to go to. Um, so that's like another project that we're working on. And because of that relationship that we developed, we now have more politicians involved in that project. Um, and the doors just keep opening and opening and opening afterwards. Sometimes it's very overwhelming. And I think that's the thing about advocacy that can get really scary. Like if you're the type of person like me who doesn't like attention, and it probably sounds weird for me to say that considering like I'm on Instagram doing these advocacy projects. I have a podcast that I work on um, with Crit. 
and I'm like really out there and I put myself out there, but it terrifies me um, to do that. But I know I, I'm only doing it for myself and I'm also doing it for the people who also might feel terrified to fight for their own rights or, you know, want something happen, but don't feel like they have the resources or the knowledge or whatever. Um, but yeah, advocacy has been a great way to learn all so all the concepts that you're learning in school and really apply them because sometimes you don't get the opportunity depending on you know what school you go to what your program is set up like and so everything that I've learned in classes I've also taken and now applied it in a real life setting and when I go to job interviews I can actually talk about those things and being like yeah I actually have experience in this you oh how did you get that well I had to start that and initiate this myself and this is like how that worked out and so I feel like advocacy opens so many different doors to different skills. And now I have to learn more about data and <laughs> how do you clean up data? How do you collect data? And that's something that I never thought I would do without this project um, in particular. Yeah, that's awesome. And first of all, I'll just say just leverage other people to do the data stuff because <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. That's how we work in public health. Um, but that, that's really awesome. That's some great advice for people, um, well, students out there who really might feel stuck, might feel they don't know where to go. There is a way for you to be mm -hmm. active in, in whatever issue it is that is bothering you. Like just be proactive, find like-minded people, create those collaborations. And as, as Kimon said, um, it's just gonna snowball and continue to grow and, and build. And, and as, as you said, you're gonna have experiences to talk about. You're gonna have networks that, that you're building. You might even need that interview in, in the end because you might just get pulled into an organization that you're <laughs> working with and, and things like that. So I feel like there's, there's so much fruitful information in there and I, I appreciate you sharing that. Of course. I think the other thing though is like, I don't want anything to ever feel like a secret. Cause sometimes people are like, oh, how did you get into that? Like, is that a secret? No, I want to be able to share the information just so you can do it too. Um, and like social media makes advocacy way more accessible to people um, as well. Like you can even notice that last year during Black Lives Matter movement where it was youth and it was younger folks that actually put together protests, put together um, bail funds, put together a lot of different things to mobilize people and like definitely use what you have. And if social media is something that you have, like use it, talk to the right people um, and you'll, and never take no as an answer. Like you will always find somebody to support you at the end. And I think that's sometimes really hard to hear um, is a no, like ignore it, move on to the next person. That's what I do all the time. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, this is like some great, great information and insights with people. And I feel like we can have a discussion just about this one project uh, in, <laughs> yeah. in, in the future. And I would love to like, bring on some other people that, that have been working with you on this project to hear what, what they have to say and things like that. So I'm definitely going to loop back around <laughs> to, to have that conversation with you later on. For um, sure. Yeah. So before we wrap up here, is there any last words that you wanted to share with, with people out there? Oh, that's always really hard. <laughs> um, I think like the biggest piece of advice or, you know, maybe this is something that people need to hear is yes, public health is a very broad field. There's like so much that you can do and it becomes sometimes very overwhelming. Um, I get multiple <laughs> DMs about, you know, what kind of jobs are out there? Or what can I do with my public health degree? And the biggest thing that I think I want people to know is the reason why like public health is structured the way it is, is because it borrows from different disciplines don't focus on titles, like never focus on job titles, focus on skills, focus on things that are transferable um, that you can put into different, uh, different uh, job titles, whatever it may be. Like I personally believe that the public health program or public health degree is one of the most marketable degrees out there because you are literally expected to know everything in a way. Like you're literally expected to know so much stuff that you never really realize, and that's just because of how connected everything is. So if you're about somebody who's really interested in solving problems, if you're somebody who loves learning all the time, because in public health, you never stop learning, you always have to be on top of everything to, you know, have the knowledge to share and like support people in different communities. Um, this is probably the field for you. And if you have doubts about it, just dive in, jump in, read a book, 
listen to all of Omari's podcast episodes. Like just take the time to learn about it. And if you feel like it's for you, you belong. Like everybody belongs in public health. We all have a role to play at the end of the day. Um, if you want to take it a step further, that's totally up to you. Um, but yeah, do it. Like drink the Kool-Aid, come here, be here. We need you to support us and to support everybody else around you. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely agree with that. And, and I think like Masters of Public Health program is one of the graduate programs where like you don't really get very specific on things. I feel like you just have a broad knowledge mm -hmm. skill set that can be applied to, to various things. And I do agree with you that it's very marketable once once you approach it the right way. And, and yeah. that's definitely something that we're, we could all can learn from. But uh, thank you for that advice. So uh, where can people connect with you? Um, so you can connect with me on Instagram, so cayman.mph, and then I think by the time this episode comes out, I will have my own website. That's so exciting. I'm actually really excited about it. Um, so you can connect with me on my website as well, and that's also going to be probably cayman.mph.ca because I want the CA in there um, to stay Canadian to my roots. <laughs> um, so that's going to be that as well. So you can connect with me on there. Um, and my email is also in my Instagram bio. So you can probably connect with me on email if that's something more comfortable. But DMs work best. So you can, I, I will respond eventually. So just DM me. <laughs> yeah, I, I know how that feeling goes. <laughs> but, but yeah, well, thank, thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing on this new version of the podcast. Uh, I look forward to seeing your website unveiled and, and everything else that you're doing. You're doing amazing things. Keep it up keep being the dope person that you are and not inspiring others to come into the field of public health and do the great work that they need to do. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me. Like, this is something that I can now check off my bucket list. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. I'm definitely going to have you back on for a longer <laughs> version of your story uh, when, when you graduate or, or sometime later on. So just be on the lookout for that as well. Um, if, if you've taken any value from what Caitlin said today, definitely go and support her on coffee and buy her a burrito so she can enjoy one of those burritos. <laughs> um, but thank you all for tuning in today. I really appreciate it. Make sure to subscribe, leave a like, leave a review. Um, share it with a friend and I greatly appreciate you all. And if you want to mon monetarily support myself and I can also get myself a burrito, you can go to buymeacoffee.com <laughs> forward slash the PH millennial and uh, support there. But I greatly appreciate you and you all will see me next week. Public Health Millennial out.